holes in the outdated system and make real tax reform happen. Tax reform is about creating jobs, growing the economy, and supporting our families and businesses for the future. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Uh, the Assistant Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. President, let me commend my colleague from Alaska. Uh, I don't know the particulars of your bill, but as I listen to your description of it, uh, it is long overdue. Simplifying this tax code so the average American feels that it's fair and understandable is essential for the integrity of our tax system. Uh, I have always said that there's one law we could pass which would result in tax simplification overnight, and that would be a requirement that every member of the Senate and House prepare and file their own personal income tax returns. Uh, it is a humbling experience. A few years ago in Springfield, Illinois, when my accountant passed away, I decided as a lawyer and a senator, I'll do it myself. <laughs> I spent the whole Sunday afternoon and then Monday went begging for help. And I thought to myself, mine isn't that complicated. It should be a system that is much simpler and more direct and fair. And I thank you for stepping in to uh, meet that challenge. The Bowles Simpson Commission talked about tax reform as one of the central elements to dealing with our deficit and expanding our economy. And I think I might add to that fairness in the way our taxes are treated. So thank you for your leadership on that. I thank my colleague for it. Well, Mr. President, uh, we're now in the countdown phase as to whether or not this government of the United States of America, the most prosperous nation in the world, is going to shut down, turn out the lights, close its doors, and walk away. And that could happen tomorrow night at midnight. If it does, it is an unmitigated disaster. There is no winner. No political party can claim that they've come out ahead in this exercise. It makes us all look bad, deservedly so. This morning I called into a local radio station in downstate Illinois, and the host said, you ought to hear the phone call, Senator. I said, I can guess what they're saying. What's wrong with those people in Washington that they can't sit down and reach an agreement? They're supposed to be our leaders. They're supposed to work out our problems. They're not supposed to throw up their hands and throw a tantrum. And that's, frankly, what will happen if we close down this government. Now, I think there are ways for us to reach an agreement. There are certain things that we all agree on. And let me tell you what they are. Our deficit and debt are serious national problems. They threaten our future, and they leave a legacy to our children and grandchildren which we can, cannot def defend. In order to reduce our deficit and our debt, we need to change in Washington. We need to cut spending, we need to be honest about it, and we need to tell the American people we represent what it means. Some of it will require sacrifice. But on both sides of the aisle, there is no argument over what I've just said. We need to cut spending, and we need to reorder the priorities of government. But there's something more we need to do, and I credited two Minnesota legislators who wrote a letter to the New York Times a few weeks ago that I thought, in a few words, put it together. This Democrat and Republican wrote in and said, we're facing a fiscal crisis in our state, and what we've discovered is we can't tax our way out of it, we can't cut our way out of it, we need to think our way out of it. We need to find ways to deliver essential services to the American people in a more cost-efficient way. We need to stop the duplication, waste, and inefficiency that are clearly part of our government today. So, where are we? We are involved in negotiations primarily between the Majority Leader, Harry Reid of Nevada, and Speaker John Boehner of Ohio. They are trying to work out an agreement so that we can move forward and finish this year's funding. It's six months and a few days, but it's critically important we get it done. And they're close. In fact, I would say, and I just asked Senator Reid if this was a fair representation, that the dollar amount of this negotiation is all but completed. The dollar amount is all but completed, meaning that both sides have agreed how much we will cut spending for the remainder of this year. And to give credit where it's due, uh, to Speaker Boehner and the House Republicans, there are significant cuts. And their initiative in this area, they can point to as part of the agreement. On the other side of the ledger, I think at the end of the day, we'll be able to say as Democrats, yes, we supported spending cuts, but we drew the line where we thought it was important for the future of this country. 
We made sure that the cuts weren't too deep in job training programs for the unemployed and new workers in America. We made certain that the cuts weren't too deep when it came to education, particularly for children from low and middle income families. We made certain that the cuts weren't too deep when it came to medical research and the basic competitive research necessary for the American economy and businesses to expand and a host of other things. But those three major areas of jobs, job creation, education, and research, we fought for. And at the end of the day, I think we can point with pride to the fact that most of those are going to be largely protected. So we can both walk out of the room with some satisfaction that after all of this time, we have reached the point where the dollar amounts are ba in basic agreement. I'm not going to say in total agreement, but basic agreement. So why am I not standing here saying with certainty the government will not shut down? Because unfortunately now, the House Republicans have decided that this is no longer a battle over the budget deficit. It's a battle over issues, issues that don't relate directly to the spending of our government or the size of our deficit. One of the things they're insisting on are a group of writers that are part of H.R. 1, their budget bill, which restrict the authority of the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington to deal with environmental issues. Now, I totally disagree with the House Republican position on this, and they are insisting on it. I would commend to them to pick up that always scintillating volume, the congressional record, from yesterday and read what happened on the Senate floor. Yesterday on the Senate floor, the Democratic majority agreed with the Republican minority, and we called four amendments on the EPA. In fact, we said to the Republican leader, Senator McConnell, write your own amendment, we'll call it to the floor, we'll vote on it. It was a sweeping amendment which took the authority away from the EPA when it came to greenhouse gas emissions. I think that's the wrong position, but Senator McConnell had his right to offer it. It got 50 votes in favor, 50 votes against. It failed. But we had the debate. We're not ducking this issue, I say to Speaker Boehner. We have faced it. We have voted on it. This chamber has spoken on that issue and three other debates and votes yesterday on EPA. None of those proposals got more than a dozen votes. But we've had the debate. We're not running away from it. So to insist now that as part of any budget agreement, we accept the House position on the EPA is to ignore the obvious. The Senate has spoken. The Senate has debated and voted, and it's clear where we stand. Now, the second issue that Speaker Boehner insists has to be part of this package is one that troubles me, because it goes to the heart of some basic health programs for people across America. It's the Title X Family Planning Program. Speaker Boehner's approach would eliminate the entire Title X Family Planning Program. How big an expense is this? $327 million. Since 1970, the Title X funding has provided men and women in every state with basic primary and secondary health care, including annual exams, cancer screening, family planning, and testing and treating for sexually transmitted infection. In 2009, Title X funded providers performed 2.2 million pap tests, 2.3 million breast exams, and over 6 million tests for infections, including HIV. Title X services prevent nearly 1 million unintended, unplanned pregnancies each year, almost half of which would otherwise end up in an abortion. Family planning programs like Title X not only give men and women command over their lives, they save us money. Every public dollar invested in family planning saves us almost $4, $3.74 to be exact, in Medicaid-related expenses. If we ended Title X, as Speaker Boehner and the House Republicans insist, it would result in more unintended pregnancies and, sadly, more abortions, and it would result in more than 5 million women losing access to basic, primary, and preventative health care. Mr. President, we're prepared to debate this. If the House Republican position is that we need to close these clinics across America, we need to eliminate access to basic primary health care to literally millions of women and men across America, I'm ready for the debate. 
but to hold up this budget negotiation, insisting that unless the House Republican position on Title X, eliminating it, is accepted, then we can't reach an agreement? We have to shut down the government? Does Speaker Boehner really propose that we shut down the government of the United States of America unless we are willing to cut Title X family planning programs and health clinics, close the doors in health clinics across America? Is that what the last election was about? I don't think so. I think the American people said in the last election, get serious about the deficit and start working together and stop your squabbling. Those were the two basic messages I took out of it. Well, we're getting serious about the deficit because we are nearly in full agreement on the dollar cuts necessary for the remainder of this year. I don't remember the last election being a referendum on whether poor people and children in America would have access to health care at Title X clinics. H.R. 1 included an amendment from a co congressman from Indiana that barred Planned Parenthood from receiving any federal funding, including Medicaid reimbursements, CDC grants, and teen pregnancy prevention program funding. Planned Parenthood health centers provide comprehensive care to millions of low-income and uninsured individuals each year. Forty-eight percent, 1.4 million, of their patients are on Medicaid and would lose access to their primary care. This provision is presented as a means to prevent Planned Parenthood from using federal funds for abortion. However, federal law already prohibits the use of federal dollars for abortion. That is not the issue, except under the Hyde Amendment, which goes back decades now, except in cases of rape, incest, or if the life of the woman is threatened by the pregnancy. Abortion counseling represents 3% of Planned Parenthood's services. And yet, this amendment, this rider from Congressman Pence, would ignore that. 90% of the care provided at Planned Parenthood is preventive care, cervical and breast cancer screening, family planning, sex education, and the treatment of infection. If this amendment were enacted, most of the 800 health centers in the U.S and 23 centers in Illinois, including in my hometown of Springfield, would be forced to close. This prohibition on Planned Parenthood funding is a rider on the House budget bill that is now the stumbling block for an agreement on deficit reduction for the remainder of the year and keeping the government open. It is ridiculous that Planned Parenthood which receives Title X funding, should be such a target and should be an obstacle to an agreement. We understand the conscience clause restrictions that are in the law when it comes to the issue of abortion. That's not what this is about. This is about family planning. And those of us who personally oppose abortion believe that women should be given the information and opportunity to take care of themselves and make their own family decisions. That's what Planned Parenthood is about. And this amendment would close down those clinics across America. That, I believe, is a move in the wrong direction. We can work together, and we should, to deal with this budget deficit. Paul Ryan is a congressman from Janesville, Wisconsin. I know him. I like him. We worked together for almost a year on the Deficit Commission. He's a bright, hardworking young man and chairman of the House Budget Committee. He has proposed a plan for the budget for the remainder of the next five to ten years. It's not a plan that I agree with, but I respect the fact that he put the time in to prepare it. The reason I don't agree with it is that unlike the Bull Simpson Commission, the budget plan that Congressman Ryan has proposed does not really deal in a comprehensive and fair fashion with the challenge of the deficit. Here's what I think and the Commission believed. If you're serious about the deficit, you need to put everything on the table everything. What Congressman Ryan has done on the Republican side is to say we are not going to put on the table any savings from the Pentagon over the next 10 years. Mr. President, that's hard to imagine. $500 billion a year plus we spent at the Pentagon, no savings. While we're cutting programs in every direction, we can't find a way to protect our men and women in uniform, keep America safe and secure, and eliminate the obvious waste of money that goes on with much of the contracting in the Pentagon? Of course we can. 
I'm sorry that Congressman Ryan doesn't see that. I do. And I believe it should be part of the conversation. And secondly, there's no suggestion of any revenue at all as part of the solution. In fact, Congressman Ryan goes in the opposite direction and continues the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. If you're worried about explaining to your children and grandchildren how we can leave them this debt, how could you explain Congressman Ryan's position that would have us borrow over a trillion dollars over the next 10 years to give tax cuts to the wealthiest people in America? How can you explain to your children, we're going to go to China to borrow money to give tax cuts to wealthy people in America as we cut our deficit? That's his approach, and I don't think it is complete and balanced. There's a better way. We need to look back to the Vol Simpson Commission, the Stefson Commission, and we need to move forward after we finish this debate on the budget for the rest of the year in a comprehensive and bipartisan fashion. For months, literally for months, I've been engaged in a bipartisan effort with some colleagues in the Senate. We're trying to come up with something. I don't think everyone will applaud it. I know some of my colleagues will hate it. But it's going to be an honest approach to dealing with the deficit for the next 10 years. It's going to have the same Bull Simpson goals of $4 trillion in deficit reduction and including all of the major elements of our government in this conversation. I think that's the only way to honestly approach this. And we can reach that debate once we get this immediate problem resolved. So the point I would like to close with, Mr. President, is this. We are in, at a moment here where we can resolve this issue, keep our government open, and move into the larger debate about our deficit in the years to come. It's a morally and historic imperative debate. But in order to get beyond it, I hope that Speaker John Boehner, whom I respect as well, will accept the obvious. His writers on the Environmental Protection Agency have been debated and voted on in principle already in the Senate yesterday. It's happened. We're not avoiding it. Secondly, their writer relating to zeroing out funding for Planned Parenthood under Title X funding is one that we will take up at some point. We're not running away from it. But it's one that shouldn't stop the function of this government. It would be impossible to defend closing down our government and all the hardship that would follow over that one writer or two writers that they insist on. Let's move toward reducing the deficit. But let's also reduce the political rancor here. Let's put some of these issues, which have been around for decades, off to another day. Let's make sure we consider them, and we will, but let's move forward now to keep this government open. Let the American people at the end of this week look at us and say, in the end, they got it right. We didn't like the way they reached the point, but they didn't do the irresponsible thing and walk away from their responsibilities. They accepted their duties, they kept the government functioning, and now they're going to roll up their sleeves and deal honestly with this deficit. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of the clerk. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The senior senator from Vermont is recognized. Mr. President, I ask consent to call the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I'd like to take to a moment just to describe to the American people and actually members of both bodies of Congress what's going to happen to our troops and their families if a collapse of budget negotiation forces the government to shut down. You know, we look at charts and graphs and numbers and all, but let's talk about the reality. Well, I'm sure many understand that most government services will halt. It's also important to understand some government operations will not shut down. In particular, our men and women on active duty and in the National Guard and Reserves will continue to serve, but they'll do so without pay. A time when we ask them to fight two wars, to help stay the slaughter in Libya, to keep peace around the world. Another burden is going to be added to their shoulders. They're going to be asked to do it without a paycheck. Now, some of those in our armed forces, many of them, do not have savings to fall back on in hard time. Many, a family member is overseas fighting for America. And their family is living back here paycheck to paycheck to pay for their groceries, to pay the car payments, or the bills for a sick child, or rent or a mortgage. Or the other member of the family, the one who earns a paycheck, is over facing the possibility of dying on the field of battle. Now we tell them, oh, stay right out there and fight. By golly, we're proud of you fighting. Sorry we can't pay you. Sorry we can't pay you. Because members of Congress and the White House can't come together in a deal. We can't pay you. Uh, gee whiz, you may not be able to, your family may not be able to buy groceries. This child may not get medical care. But boy, are we proud of you. And if you get killed, we'll give you a medal. Come on. Like many Americans, some of those who serve in our military do live paycheck to paycheck. They do depend on their pay each month to put food on the table and keep a roof over their families' heads. Certainly, mortgage lenders are not known for accepting excuses when the monthly payments come due. But excuses are all that some members of Congress can offer for why they will not come to the table and make sure our men and women in uniform get the pay they've earned. This is not bumper sticker sloganeering government. This is what really happens. It's so easy for people to stand up and just sanctimoniously state, oh, we're doing this for the good of the country. You're doing it and you're harming the families of our men and women in harm's way, especially disturbing the hard times that now in prospect for our troops have been completely avoidable. The possibility of a government shutdown is very real because a relative few are willing to play politics and brinksmanship at a time when the public wants basic, unadorned statesmanship. They want Republicans and Democrats to act as though they also have a stake in the course of our government. The American people want Congress to do its job. That's certainly not too much to ask. Those who are insisting on their way or no way should pause to reflect on what their intransigence means to our troops and their families, in fact, every American. The decision to put politics ahead of the American people is reckless and imposes real hardship on real people. It is crueler still, knowing some of our troops already facing fears of death or injury. Sleepless nights in forward operating bases must now add paying the electric bill and feeding their families to their list of daily worries. I've been with some of those troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. They have enough on their mind. They have enough that they face every single hour of every single day and especially every single night to not have the added worry will our families be able to pay their bills. And I worry, as co-chair of the National Guard Caucus, I worry especially for the Vermont National Guard troops who are currently forward deployed to locations around the world. Many of them come from their small towns and cities of Vermont. They face these very fears. And shutting down the government 
an ideologically motivated faction in Congress is willing to breach our most fundamental pact with these men and women. We have always said, protect our nations overseas and we'll protect your loved ones at home. Who can justify violating that pact with the men and women in uniform? Some in Congress are already seeking cover, claiming they put forward plans to fund the Pentagon and our troops. But of course, even these transparent political ploys would not pay many of our intelligence personnel, our brave and dedicated forward deployed consular staff and officers and others, many of whom work side by side with our troops. Not to mention the vast number of individuals working in communities across the nation to support our overseas operations. Every one of these dedicated public servants, every one of our troops, deserves to be paid for a day's work. Our troops and their families, and those supporting our troops and their families, have enough to worry about without needlessly being pushed to the brink of a costly government shutdown. Mr. President, I hope, I hope, as we sit here in our plush offices, with staff and everything we ever want, being well paid as members of Congress, let's let the reality sink in. The distinguished presiding officer has spoken about this many times. The reality is men and women, families throughout our country, who are being severely hurt. And let's not forget that. And in this area, I note that some of the other body reacted to the ire of a minority of vocal anti-government extremists who make no desire, no secret of their desire to shut down government, even while they complain the government doesn't do enough for them, are proposing reckless cuts in programs vital to job creation and national security. Many of the other party are masters of blaming others for a budget deficit and debt that they created during the last administration. Self-proclaimed fiscal conservatives who in a few short years racked up a trillion dollar deficit by refusing to pay for two, war two wars. They're just borrowing the money for two wars, something that never been done before in this country. Their idea was to cut taxes for the millionaires, cut taxes for those companies to ship our jobs overseas, cut corporate taxes, and borrow the money to pay for two wars. They burned through the Clinton era surpluses and then started a massive borrowing binge. And they want to lecture us on fiscal conservatism. The catastrophic earthquake and tsunami and another earthquake in the last hour in Japan and tsunami, the nuclear crisis in Japan, as well as the popular uprisings and violence in North Africa and the Middle East, demonstrate once again the essential role that our embassies and consulates and our foreign assistance program play in protecting the safety and security of American citizens and our allies. <coughs> Excuse me. I hear so many words, drastic cuts our international operations and programs. They're less than 1% of our federal budget. When a national, natural man-made disaster occurs overseas and Americans are affected, or an American is arrested and locked in a foreign jail, these same critics of these programs, these same people that want to cut all the budget for overseas programs, say, where's our State Department? Where's our U.S. AID, why aren't they immediately taking care of things? Oh, sorry, we, we, uh, we forgot we cut out your budget. You can't be there, but you should be there anyway. In Egypt alone, at least 75,000 Americans were living, working, and studying when that country erupted. So I will put my whole statement on the record, but I would note that since the earthquake and tsunami, U.S. consular officers in Japan and Washington worked ceaselessly to assist Americans in Japan. We do it throughout, uh, throughout the world. You know, we can't have it both ways. You can't, on the one hand, support drastic budget cuts, at the same time expect the agencies that are losing personnel and resources to be able to 
responded to help Americans in need. So let me ask consent, uh, Mr. President, my full statement be made part, thank you, part of the record uh, as though read in both issues. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I suggest the answer a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
present. The junior senator from North Dakota is recognized. I ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Mr. President, I would like to speak this afternoon about an issue that I believe is of paramount importance to our efforts to restore America's economic vitality and to control, to control our debt and our deficit. I'd like to talk about jobs. I want to begin, however, by telling you a little bit about my home state of North Dakota. That's because today, while much of the nation is greatly challenged by recession and joblessness, North Dakota is strong, arguably the strongest that we've been at any time in our history. The reason is jobs. Last week, we learned that North Dakota at 3.7 percent once again has the lowest unemployment rate in the nation, a distinction that we've held since June of 2008. Nationally, as you know, the picture is much different. As I speak, nearly 14 million Americans are still out of work, and the rate of unemployment is hovering at nearly 9 percent, where it has been for many months. Another 8 million Americans are underemployed, working part-time because their hours have been cut or they haven't been able to find a full-time job. Sadly, a million more have just stopped looking. Make no mistake, America has a budget problem because of too much spending, but also because America has a jobs problem. I ask you, how do we generate revenues to help balance our budget, pay down debt, and provide the essential services people need without raising taxes? Jobs. How do we empower people to access affordable health insurance and quality health care without intrusive government programs? Again, jobs. How do we help secure Social Security and Medicare for our seniors and future generation? Jobs. Mr. President, if we put 10 million of those 14 million unemployed workers back on the job at the average national wage of about $45,000, it would generate more than $50 billion in additional revenues for the Social Security Trust Fund and an additional $13 billion for Medicare every year. Obviously, that would make a huge difference for both of those programs. Clearly, to fully address our current economic predicament, we need to create jobs and lots of them. Those jobs will be created by the private sector, not by government, by the private sector. But to help our entrepreneurs and businesses create them, we must build the best business climate possible. Ten years, ten years ago, in North Dakota, we set a course to do just that. Beginning in 2001, when I first took office as governor of North Dakota, we made conscious policy decisions that would over time grow and diversify our economy and create thousands of jobs for our citizens. First, we set out to build the best business climate possible, forging a legal tax and regulatory climate that would attract investment and stimulate innovation. Second, we developed a roadmap for success, an economic development strategic plan that targeted industries where North Dakota holds natural advantages owing to our resources, and our people. As part of our larger strategy, we also developed a comprehensive energy policy called Empower North Dakota, which worked aggressively to develop all of our state's natural resources and energy resources, both traditional and renewable. We even established a North Dakota trade office, a public sector, private sector partnership that helps market North Dakota products and services around the world to bring new dollars into our state. As a result of these efforts, between 2000 and 2009, North Dakota's economy grew at an average annual GDP growth rate of 6.4 percent. So by the end of the decade, we had grown by 75 percent. That compares to a national growth rate over the same time period of 41 percent. And all that work to cultivate overseas markets worked too. Our exports of farm machinery, aircraft parts, biotech products, and other North Dakota goods grew by more than 300 percent in 10 years. That compares to a national growth rate of just over 60 percent. As a result, we balanced our budget year in and year out, and today we have no general obligation debt. We have a substantial surplus and strong reserves to secure our economic future. 
Furthermore, to get there, we not only held the line on taxes, we reduced them. We reduced property tax and we reduced income tax. Over the decade, we generated nearly 15% growth in total employment, encompassing almost every sector of our economy and every region of our state. At the same time, we boosted per capita income from 84% of the national average, well below the national average in 2000, and today we're above the national average, 103% of the national average in per capita income, and we've moved up from 37th among all the states to 17th in terms of our ranking among the 50 states. The Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, the New York Times, USA Today, The Economist, Forbes, Money Magazine, even the London Times, all have written about North Dakota's progress. Joel Kotkin, in a recent Wall Street Journal piece, called North Dakota's approach, quote, sensible thinking, end quote, about the economy. Last year, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce ranked North Dakota number one among all 50 states as the nation's top overall economic growth performer and job creator, not for the year, but for the decade. Now, the things we did in North Dakota are not unique to our state. The principles that we used are based on common sense and a belief that the American economy is the engine that drives the car. We can create jobs and lift our nation out of the financial quandary that we're in. If we have the will to act and if we focus tire tirelessly on the kinds of things that create jobs and opportunity for our people. To do that, I would like to propose a three-part strategy to get America working again. First, we need to create a legal tax and regulatory climate that gets business investment off the sidelines and gets people back to work. Second, we need to rein in spending and control our debt and deficit. And third, we need a comprehensive pro-growth energy policy to fuel our economy reduce our dependence on foreign energy, and create good jobs for American workers. Let's go through each one of these very straightforward recommendations, starting with the need to create a strong business climate for America with the kind of legal, tax, and regulatory certainty that investors need to create jobs. That means passing legislation that will eliminate or modify unwarranted or misguided regulations that are impeding business investment and stifling innovation in our country. That effort is already underway in the Senate. Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas has offered a bill called the Regulatory Responsibility for Our Economy Act, which I'm proud to co-sponsor. This bill will give the force of law to a presidential executive order issued earlier this year that, pro that proposes to review, quote, rules that may be outmoded, ineffective, insufficient, or excessively burdensome, and to modify, streamline, expand in some cases, or repeal them. If passed, our bill will make sure that we will take a clear-eyed look at the rules and help restore regulatory certainty to the markets. When we talk about unwarranted laws and regulations, however, we don't need to look too far into the past. We need only to look at, we can also look at recently enacted laws that impede job creation and sap economic vitality. Last year's federal health care bill, for example, included a 1099 reporting provision that introduced a new level of bureaucracy and expense for America's nearly 28 million small businesses, the very engines of job creation in this country. But it's not only the feature of last year's, excuse me, Small businesses have created 64% of all the new jobs in this country over the past 15 years, and they account for more than 97% of all employers. If we expect them to create jobs and get our economic engine going again, we need to reduce the regulatory burden, not bury them under burdensome new mandates like the 1099 requirement. That's why I and a bipartisan group of senators led by Mike Johan signed on to a bill that just this week eliminated this onerous provision in last year's health care law and sent it off to the president for signature. I want to commend my good friend Senator Johans for his leadership and his hard work on this important issue. 
But that's not the only feature of last year's health care bill that is undermining our business climate, driving up health care costs, and limiting choice for consumers. Punitive lawsuits and defensive medicine are inflating the cost of health care for American consumers by as much as $100 billion every year. Yet the health care bill that is now being implemented across our country doesn't reduce these costs. We need tort reform that will help make health care more available and reduce costs. Similarly, we need to expand competition among health insurance companies. More competition will give consumers more choice and expand the pool of the insured, thus creating further downward pressure on the cost of premiums. Just as importantly, by reducing health care costs and the regulatory burden on American businesses, we can help them to reduce costs and do what they do best, create jobs. And competition works to our advantage not only in markets at home, but in global markets as well. Another way to strengthen our economy and get job creation going again is by promoting more international trade. Smart trade agreements can restore America's competitive edge, create more income for American citizens, more opportunities for American entrepreneurs, and more foreign dollars to help balance our trade deficit and our budget. They can also help us turn around our trade imbalances with countries like China, South Korea, and the European Union. We have multi-billion dollar trade deficits with all of them, 23 billion with China in January alone. We can start the process of turning these deficits around by ratifying impending trade agreements with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama that have been languishing for three years. Our trade imbalance with South Korea alone last year was $10 billion. But the agreement awaiting approval right now could create up to 250,000 American jobs. On the other hand, if we fail to act, we stand to lose 380,000 jobs to the European Union and Canada, who have already completed their own trade agreements with those countries. With bipartisan support for these agreements, there's no reason for further delay. We need to act. Now, empowering American businesses and entrepreneurs to do business around the world is just common sense. And that common sense is precisely what we need to apply to all of our nation's challenges. I can give you a good example in my home state of North Dakota. Right now, we're facing serious flooding in the Red River Valley. And for some time, we've been working to fight chronic annual flooding in the Red River Valley, which includes the city of Fargo, one of our region's most dynamic economic engines. Part of government's role in creating an environment for private investment and economic development is securing and protecting infrastructure so that businesses can thrive. In the case of Fargo and the Valley, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has found it necessary to buy out houses in that area because it's more cost effective than protecting them year in and year out. Now, when the agency buys out a property, however, it has a hard and fast rule prohibiting building structures on that property, even flood mitigation structures, to prevent development that might require future protection from flooding. It's a reasonable ban in some, maybe in many cases, but certainly not in all. As a consequence of the rule, every year the federal government helps to pay to build temporary levees to protect homes along the Red River. And every year, we're compelled to tear those levees down again at great expense to the government after the flood. And ultimately, of course, great expense to the taxpayer. Everyone knows that permanent dikes would clearly be more cost effective and save money for local, state, and federal government. Residents know it. FEMA knows it. Local officials know it. But under current law, there's nothing they can do about it. That's why we'll be introducing legislation called the FEMA Common Sense and Cost Effectiveness Act of 2011 to give the agency the flexibility it needs to make common sense decisions in these cases. Building those levees once and leaving them in place will provide better flood protection for, for people and for property, better fiscal stewardship, and save taxpayer dollars. And that's important because good fiscal stewardship is now a matter of pressing, decisive consequence for America's future. That's why the second thing we need to do, of no less importance than building a good business climate, is to reduce spending. 
we need to control spending by the federal government. Here the numbers speak more clearly than words. Revenues this year are projected to, projected to be, revenues now, are projected to be $2.2 trillion. At the same time, current spending by the federal government is more than $3.7 trillion, leaving a deficit of $1.5 to $1.6 trillion. To meet that shortfall, we're borrowing 40 cents of every single dollar we spend, and our debt is growing at the rate of $4 billion a day. Every dollar used to service the national debt is a dollar that won't be used to build America's infrastructure, that won't be used to keep Social Security solvent, that won't be used to reduce taxes on American businesses so they can create jobs and raise the standard of living for American workers.